intersection of endurance sport, health, fitness, and life. Following the evidence where it leads with the science of self-propelled motion. This is the Endurance Experience Podcast, powered by EventHorizon.tv and hosted by Tony Rich. Swim. Bike. Run. That's triathlon. But what if it was more than that? What if it was faster, more tactical, more variable, more painful? What if it was Super League? Sure, this is triathlon, but it's also something you have never seen before. Races won as much in the mind as they are in the legs. New formats, new faces, new destinations, and the same fit arrivals. It's the triple mix. Three stages mixing up the order of disciplines. Want a swim, bike, run? Okay. But then you can run, bike, swim, and bike, swim, run. These guys don't do anything in second gear. It'll be flat out, start to finish. It'll be everything to keep you in the The stars are worried, and they have every right to be. Triathlon has grown substantially over the decades, and many of us, especially in the United States, were inspired by the Ironman long course triathlon. And triathlon actually made its debut in the Olympics in the 2000 Sydney Games, and this propelled triathlon to a, a global phenomenon as well. And so people fell in love with swimming, cycling, running, and then in that order, and People realized the fitness benefits by doing triathlon were just incredible. And so if you haven't done a triathlon and you're listening, I highly recommend that you do. You'll love it. Now we seem to be entering a new phase. Uh, the technology has brought wearable, the, the wearable technology to be smaller, better, more efficient, more powerful, uh, innovative virtual cycling tools, innovative treadmills, dynamic live stream technology. And so the confluence of all of this has brought us Super League Triathlon. And so uh, you're familiar with Swim, Bike, Run uh, as a format. Now think about having multiple stages in an arena setting, just like any other arena sport. And then you have athletes do multiple phases, but mixing up the disciplines, uh, swim, run, bike, and then immediately doing, say, run, bike, swim, and then immediately doing bike, swim, run. Or maybe swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, right? So uh, that is the concept of Super League, to really try to figure out who are the best multi-sport athletes by not necessarily doing swim, bike, run in that order. So... Today I speak with Adam Leach. He's the director of communications for Super League. And we talk about how Super League Triathlon came about. We talk about the structure and the format of the events, including all of the technology and arena environment setup that's necessary in order to pull off Super League Triathlon. We talk about pro athletes and how they contract to get involved with Super League and uh, we discuss where this is headed I mean we talk about whether or not that this could be actually a global phenomenon the next triathlon global phenomenon that catches on it's a very interesting conversation so without further delay I give you 
Adam Leach. I am on with Adam Leach. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So uh, you're out in the UK and over in the States, the, uh, the, the growth in popularity of triathlon has been pretty substantial over the last few decades. And in the States, we're primarily uh, focused on Ironman distance uh, triathlons, 70.3 and, and Ironman distance triathlon and short course is actually very popular overseas and super league, the super league triathlon has uh, created a new type of spin on the traditional swim bike run. How about we start here by, you know, just talking about how did you become involved in Super League and how did the concept come about and what was the, the core mission and approach for Super League uh, when it started? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's, it's an interesting journey Super League's been on. Um, it's, it's still a relatively young sports brand, really. Um, as, and as we know, triathlon obviously is a very young sport still. It's still a sport that's developing it's not a sport that's reached the end of its journey as it were and the end of its cycle of innovation and I think that's where Super League uh, came in it was it was basically born of conversations between Michael Dolst who's our CEO um, and and running the business on a day-to-day basis and Chris McCormack who many people will know Macca he's uh, Macca. Four, yeah <laughs> four-time world champion triathlon legend uh, great guy never short of an opinion um and yeah and one of the most recognizable faces in in the history of our sport and they were just talking um in in 2016 they were working together in thailand at the time uh a lot around triathlon the future of triathlon and kind of what they wanted to see in the in the development of the sport both as an from an ex-professional's point of view in chris uh and from michael as a as a fan of triathlon michael was uh in 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 business he'd worked uh, across like automotive industries and operationally and setting up new hubs in china for uh, car manufacturers and things like that and then had got really into triathlon when luke van leerde won uh ironman kona because michael's belgian and, and luke was belgian and it really inspired him uh to, to do a lot more triathlon while he was living in asia um in the end he ended up taking a year off to try and qualify for kona as an age grouper which he did uh, and then just decided he wanted to try and combine business and pleasure, as a, as you find a lot of people in triathlon right. like to do. Uh, he he set up um, Ch- Challenge Taiwan as it as it is, uh, which is obviously a very substantial race uh, in Asia. Um, he had the license for that for a while, and he, that's where he met Chris to start with. When Chris was coming to the end of his racing career. Um, and then they, they ended up working together further. But I think that, that they saw that there was a, a potential point of development in triathlon because unlike a lot of other sports, triathlon has traditionally been a participation-driven sport. That's obviously what drives the likes of Ironman. It's because a lot of us enjoy racing and we pay our entry fees and we turn up at events and we, we buy our merchandise and all this kind of stuff. And that, that makes a business. But um, I think that there was a belief that that the triathlon could be more than just a participation sport, that it could be a spectator experience as well. There could be a sport that could draw millions of people around the world to watch on TV, could draw people to come and attend, and, um, could make the, the protagonists, the professional athletes, household names, um, superstars, heroes of sport in a, in a way that perhaps they aren't other than outside of a niche within within the triathlon world itself. Um, and to do that, you needed to, to produce a product that was fit for a new era, an era where digital and a broadcast product is is of primary importance, really, um, to get to give the athletes a chance to to shine. Uh, an eight hour event, you know, I, I, I do Ironmans. I love Ironmans. I watch Kona. But would I sit and watch? 
an average Ironman event for eight or nine hours where not much happens. The truth is, no, I wouldn't because it's too much yeah. time uh, commitments to watch something like that. And even the ITU racing, when the Olympic distance racing's on, I mean, again, I, I would watch, sit and have every event on, but I, you know, openly I'll admit I will fast forward some bits if I've got it pre-recorded. Of course. Because yeah. if they're just rolling around on the bike in a big pack for 40 K, it's not that interesting. So the idea of Super League is it's bish, bash, bosh, basically. Fast, furious, action-packed. There's always something going on. There's there's always a controversial moment or a crazy moment. Somebody does something mad under the pressure <laughs> right. because it's such so short and sharp. Uh, you know, the races, we have a men's race and a women's race, and the whole thing is done with analysis, interviews. It's all over in two hours, both races. That's the broadcast package. It's two hours. And it's done. And so there's people getting eliminated in some of the events. It's normally three rounds of action. So it's everything is sure and it's intense. The the athletes are the best in the world and they're at full gas the entire time. So it's trying to draw that spectator experience as part of it. And in terms of just the last part of your question where I came in, my um my background has largely been in in journalism in, and around Premier League football for for many many years um but also got bitten by the triathlon bug loved triathlon was a fan of super league when it first started which had its first race in 2017 a test event in hamilton island and has then kind of built out since then i ended up i was working freelance um as well and then uh the your your sort of discussions came to to potentially join super league um permanently and i was just really excited personally by the project and with a love of triathlon uh i feel that if if triathlon is going to make um, into into the mainstream if it's going to attract fans i honestly believe super league is the best chance it's got because it's the most accessible format for people who are not just triathlon geeks um and i love triathlon i think it's an endurance sports and i think that they're life-changing and transformative and i love that message and and the and the community around it um and i feel really passionately about it and i i really personally want to try and be part of it and spread that message and and i really hope that it we can do that yeah it's very interesting and i think uh, one of the things that you said that's interesting is how it start it's the concept started with conversation and very similarly iron man started with a, a similar conversation of who, who really is the best endurance athlete. If a swimmer went up against a cyclist and a, and a marathoner, who really is, is the best. And sounds like some, some of that conversation has uh, was instrumental in bringing about super league where you're having this conversation. What, 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 what if we did the events in a different order? Uh, what if, what if we pit, you know the best of the best head to head on on treadmills and trainers and robots basically and see how they come out so uh i think that's very interesting that that was uh part of the reason super league came about some of those conversations so for the listeners now maybe you can go into the the structure and the format of of super league and how it's different from traditional triathlon swim bike run so i think that the thing about super league is is uh, is the fact that it is it is uh, in its essence is over quickly um so it's very hard it's very short sharp so it's not an eight hour race it's not even a two hour race Mm -hmm. it's it's probably 40 minutes and we have two styles of events basically we have what we call our championship series they're outdoors events. They're on very, very small courses with mm-hmm. maybe even only an 800 meter footprint. Um, very, very small, tight, technical. So it makes the bike challenging. It breaks up packs. Yeah. Um, it, it allows spectators to actually be right in on the action as well, which increases the atmosphere, which comes through on the broadcast as well. So rather than standing in like in the London we might stand in Hyde Park like at the Olympics and you'd see the athletes you know run past twice in the space of half an hour here they'll be coming past all the time (laughs) because it's such a small uh, area they'll be there all the time so that's kind of one offering we've got is our championship series that's really the has been the pinnacle and what Super League was built on however 
we do have a new style of racing, which we're racing actually at the moment, um, which is called the SLT Arena Games. And that is this hybrid, really, between real life and virtual racing. And it's quite an interesting uh, and innovative concept in the sense that uh, we're partnered with Zwift, who are a very Mm -hmm. large part of this as well. Um, Obviously, the indoor training company and and a massive, uh, massive growth product, especially while we've all been in lockdowns around the world, et cetera. And the indoor training has grown exponentially. Even oh, I've been on it. I've been on it. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, the listener base will know that well. It's very you, popular, especially now during the, the pandemic. Yeah, you felt the, the suffering as well, have you? Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> on the back of the swift racing, it's hard work. Um, yeah. So the arena games concept is, is it's kind of taking in a way our outdoor concepts, which as I explained, you have that. And then we have the different race formats within it. So there's, there's three or four different race formats. They, they mainly end up with some variation of doing three very short triathlons, more or less back to back, either completely back to back or more or less back to back. And sometimes shuffling the order between each go as well. So the athletes are constantly it's a constantly moving puzzle for them as well, which is why you get the, these crazy moments that sometimes occur, like uh, Michael Arashita from the USA jumping in and trying to swim in his shoes, try and not be eliminated <laughs> because he, he thought he was going to be last and get cut out of the race. And um, people running in bare feet because they, they think they're going to get eliminated. So they decide well, I'm not going to put my trainers on and I'm going to try and run without shoes um all these kind of things and and so we took a little bit of of that and basically put it into an indoor concept yeah so uh, arena games was was born via a conversation between michael dolls the ceo and zwift uh, and it started in in december 2019 uh, when zwift were working with the uci on uh, on a cycling uh, race and um, Michael thought this was something that could work with triathlon potentially. Could we have some mix up of esports and sort of real life racing that could work for triathlon? The conversation sort of was, was that both parties were interested, but it sort of drifted along as, you know, these sort of chats do and o- over a period of time. But then once COVID hit and, and we all ended up locked down and it was very obvious that we, we, we're not going to have championship series events outdoors with, with people flying all over the world. Um, and in fact, nobody was going to be going anywhere really. Uh, we, the, the talks around the concept were accelerated because it was, it became more and more interesting because it became clear, actually, you know what, this is something we could do in a COVID secure environment. We mm-hmm. can, there's, there's, it's being indoors. You control all the variables so you yes. can make this COVID secure so that's that was how how it came about, and, and basically it's then a blend. So the the athletes race again. It's three short sharp triathlons. So it's a two hundred meter swim, a four k bike, and a one k run. The swimming legs are all in an Olympic sized pool, so they're obviously real. Albeit it's different from normal triathlon because it's pool racing. You're not got any ability to draft anybody or get dragged around the swim or anything like that you you're on your own it's a time trial really then you're out of the swim and and the the bike and the run legs are on zwift so the 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 guys or girls put their um bikes on are are on the turbo trainer uh and they then are doing 4k on zwift and then the run legs the 1k run legs are on self-powered curved treadmills so they have to get them up to speed themselves and run. And again, those legs are realized in Swift and we do a different order for each of the triathlons. There's about two minutes, roughly depending on when they finish uh, two to three minutes between each of the legs. They get the winner. There's 10 athletes, male, 10 female in each winner gets 10 points. 10th place gets one point. The accumulated points over the three races decides a winner basically. Yeah. Um, the order's mixed up, so yeah. So it's I think uh, we've just done London. Um, that's on our YouTube channel as well. If anybody wants to go and head over and see see what we're talking about um, and, and take a look at it, it's an interesting concept. And we've we've had some top athletes taking part as well. It's great, and we're going to be in Rotterdam for another round of this on April the eighteenth. Um, yeah, it's pretty think- exciting. And, and I've been I've been you know just sort of taking a look at the social media and uh, the, the the content that you've put out. So, so it's 
200 meter swim, four kilometer bike and one kilometer run. Yeah. And, and this from your, just reading from your website, stage one is swim, run, bike. Stage two is run, bike, swim. And stage three is bike, swim, run. Is that, yeah. And so that's the arena format. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty it. incredible. Yeah, so we changed it up a bit from the so that we first did this in Rotterdam in August of 2020. That was the first time it, it happened, and and to be, <laughs> it was a nerve wracking experience for us all because uh, nobody really had ever done anything quite like this before. And it's obviously it's all great in theory, but it's an event that's so dependent on technology uh, yes. and so many things that are out of your control as well that that actually you can set up everything as a company and organization. And it, something could fall over that's not even anything to do with you, and yeah. and the and the event will just you know just fall apart basically. Right. Um, so yeah, it was it was a nerve wracking experience. But one thing we did change up from last time was we we actually did so the the athletes move around in a in a very logical order. So we place obviously the pool is two hundred meters, so you obviously dive in and get out at the same end. So then right. they run to the next piece of equipment. So in we did uh, it differently in Rotterdam. So we started with swim, bike, run, obviously traditional triathlon format. Uh-huh. However, so if you can imagine on the side of the pool, you've got, uh, in that instance, you've got all 10 turbo trainers. So they would jump, get out of the pool, jump on the turbo trainers, do their bike, and then go to the run, uh, which will be the next 10 items of, of, of stuff. Then we move them clockwise around that. So then they would start on the bike, go to the run and then in the swim and then they go from the run into the swim and the bike. So they'd always be moving the same direction. They'd not be skipping a piece of kit and, and the transitions Got there getting messy and then collapsing. Oh, into so s- swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run. Uh, so the idea now is to, uh, to finish on the run. That's I kind of it. key. I think we took from the first one because we finished on, because doing it in that other order, we finished on the bike and finishing on the bike just it, obviously the athletes are knackered but they're all sat down it's yeah. not a very dramatic finale particularly so we thought let's finish on the run this time that will make life a, a little bit more <laughs> yeah interesting potentially yeah. so that's why the equipment therefore changes position and so therefore you go swim run bike run bike swim bike swim run so it's it's it was a, a small tweak um, but I think it was quite effective at the end. Obviously, all the athletes are full gas. And at yeah. the end of the run, you kind of have the images that you've probably seen on social media of, you know, your, your Johnny Brownleys or your who Sophie Caldwell's like laid out on the floor on the treadmills, just sort of, you know, <laughs> gasping for breath at the end of it. And that's kind of what you want, right? It's the drama. It's the emotion. Um, and the, the arena games as well, the extra th- the layer of it that it allows us to do. It yeah. allows us to capture loads of data so you can see live what watts per kilogram they're pushing, what speed they're running live, their, their cadence, um, all kinds of things. And obviously, because they're not moving around, as it were, because they're fairly static, we can get the cameras right in their faces effectively and you can see the pain the suffering that they're doing but on terms of that it's not just a voyeuristic isn't it good to watch somebody suffer but i think in terms of a wider audience from our point of view it heroes our athletes because people see who are not triathlon fans see these people and see the actual incredible athletes they are uh, the immense physical effort that they're able to put in and performances they generate over three different sports effectively within one uh, and I think it, it elevates triathlon because it makes people realize that, that these athletes are truly amazing. Yeah. And that it's very interesting with the, with the events uh, that the way that you have them. And well, I, I know just from experience, one of the, the hardest things you could ever do is try to swim after you've been really running hard. It's probably one of the hardest things to do uh, <laughs> as a, as an athlete, but just generally the, the, that, that complexity that, that you add, right. To, you know, try to see who really is the best. If you were to do the, you know, this in a multi-stage effort. I mean, I think that's a very 
significant innovation of of the sport and and a test of uh, of the athlete. There's so many things, like you said, that you could you can conceive of coming into play. So so how is the environment changed? So you know one one of the things that they tell you is that when you when you uh, you get out of the water, never to run, go immediately to a to run right because you could fall yeah. on a pool deck. <laughs> yeah. So how do you how do you adapt the environment? to uh to to be accustomed to this unique event so i mean in terms of this great really great point because there's a lot there is a lot that goes into it and a lot that goes into the technology as well like mm-hmm. making sure that everything blends together fairly seamlessly so yes. for the athletes it's a seamless experience whereby they are just given a platform to perform at their optimum Mm -hmm. We give them a lot to think about because they only have a short period between the races and the order changes every time they've got to sort out their transition boxes and, you know, get their, you put their elastic bands back on their bike shoes, get their run trainers back in the box, get their swim hats and goggles sorted out in in a very short period. But actually the environment, we try and make it as straightforward as possible. And like I said, one of the things about that is the fact they always move in the same direction. They never skip a piece of equipment as it were be at the swimming pool the, it, yeah. the, the runners or the or the uh, turbos and in terms of the actual like arena itself um the entire area is carpeted uh so we take the pool deck out of the equation with carpeting obviously we we uh, can also uh add that can add as well to the feel of and look and feel of the event because our colors are sort of black and gold or black and mm-hmm. yellow type colors and we can make it black um as well on the floor so we can make it look a bit more dark and moody and and kind of on brand as it were um we do the same with all the the stuff around it we we even uh sort of carpet the areas where the athletes will dive in on the side of the pool to um at the end of the pool to make sure that they're not just going to jump up and slip in in a hurry so we, we try and do as much as we can for them we've got um you know state-of-the-art equipment for for like how how they can uh have their ipads that have got zwift or, or the ipads that have got zwift in front of them on both the the uh turbo and the uh um, yeah. and the treadmill as well um we've obviously got fans individual fans for them that they can have set at whatever they want to try and keep them cool on as we all know with static equipment it's a it's a sweat fest. And the one thing that you do know about <laughs> anybody who's obviously familiar with indoor swimming pools knows that they're hot environments. They are, it is hot and it is humid in a swimming pool environment anyway. Um, let alone if you're sat, you know, pushing 350 Watts on a, on your bike. Um, That's right. Likewise the kit, there's a lot of tech that goes in around the kit. So we use the tax Neo T2 uh, turbo trainers. Obviously all the athletes have different requirements because they have different cassettes and, and uh, braking right. systems and stuff like that. That we So tax are in contact with all the athletes to ensure that everything is seamless for their bikes uh, to be set up on the day. Um, obviously there's Bluetooth connectivity from our end. That's, that's kind of capturing data. We've got them wearing heart rate monitors for data We've got um, run sensors on the treadmill, so we obviously can tell how fast they're going, and that can go into the into the Zwift production. We've had added obstacles around COVID. Rotterdam, for example, was logistically it was a, it was a marvel in many ways because uh, because of the COVID restrictions, we couldn't even bring our production company with us, so we had to use a local Dutch production company filming mm-hmm. with the athletes in in a what was a closed environment there were only 100 people in that venue um all of the uh all of the foot feed is going back to an ob truck in london to be produced and edited will mccloy and chris mccormack are our commentators they were commentating from australia um, wow. to the pictures in real time obviously all of the data that's being uh, live data that's coming from the turbo trainers and the treadmills is going back to Zwift to obviously enable the live races to be done. Zwift have their own production house in, in Edinburgh and they produce the, um, uh, the actual gameplay as it were, the avatars from the data and they produce the camera angles as well, because they can move the camera angles around in the, in the, online world itself and the data graphics that you see on screen have to be done by another company and they were going out to singapore so you had things in 
in like four, three, what, three continents and from five countries. And this is all having to go into one OB truck and go out broadcast live around the world on, on right. uh, TV stations and on digital platforms. Um, so it is quite, you know, sometimes you just sit there and you think this is quite a marvel that this is even coming out, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, all of the, the technology that goes into it is uh, pretty incredible. Uh, so I work with some folks uh, in the States here to do indoor, indoor triathlon events and just sort of as a, you know, sort of recreational thing. We actually, you know, did, did a couple of indoor Ironman just to see if we can, <laughs> we could do it. That's so I know, cool. I know how, <laughs> how much work that goes in. All the technology has to be, has to be right. You have to get it, get it right. I mean, so, you know, for instance, in, in the pool, how do you do the, uh, the swim? Do, do you have technology that actually, calculates the the swim time as soon as they push off and as soon as they finish in touch how do, how does that work yes yes we do we we have that and we can we can record it at the 50 meter split intervals as well um so we can kind of monitor what they're up to all the time i think i think the the interesting thing about the swim is it's kind of it feels the most basic part of the entire triathlon because it's obviously the one part that it, in the in the actual arena itself you can sit and you can actually see obviously in a traditional sense what is going on as whereas um if you're in the arena right other than the big screens obviously it's just people then on on bikes and and yeah. treadmills and i think that's an interesting thing for us going forward because for us this concept um was was sort of being discussed before covid in covid it became a really obvious idea to try and see through yeah but I think we've now got this this sense that actually this is something that will live beyond COVID now, which is a which is a very satisfying uh, for for multiple reasons. One, uh, it has drawn a, a new and a different audience because it is a mixture of esports and uh, and sort of real life sports, if you like. Um, mm-hmm. That that in itself brings a slightly different audience demographic. Uh, to it obviously there's the ability to run this throughout winter periods right when traditionally triathlon will shut down um, particularly you know northern hemisphere season for example um, winter period triathlon just closes off um, this this could fill that gap um, it, we're not for us it's not a replacement for our championship series it's a separate entity and i think the other thing is obviously when our of covid once we've hopefully uh got less restrictions there's a potential here to to grow this and to take this around to cities all over the place with with these great athletes and put two three four five thousand people in the stadium to watch them do this yes we obviously need to produce a production for that right now when you're sat in in the venue it's a really fascinating place to be but yeah it's not produced for the people in the venue. It's produced for people watching at home. So there is a challenge around the production of it, but actually it's not probably that difficult. And we could actually have huge crowds watching these triathletes in a way that's very difficult in an outdoor triathlon, simply because of the logistics of it. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's kind of, there seems to be a lot of potential. And even though it's, you know, as I say, it really accelerated because of COVID. I think it's got a life after it. I think what is interesting as well, I don't know what you think about this with, with obviously your understanding of triathlon, but we kind of are speculating amongst ourselves that even though at the moment the people racing this are the big names in triathlon, you're Johnny Brownlees, you know, we had Georgia Taylor Brown, Lucy Charles Barkley, et cetera. Going forward, what, what you see in a lot of this indoor sports is there are people who are, not uh who are fantastic on Zwift, for example. They're fantastic yeah, yes. indoors and but they're not able to produce that on the level outdoors. So we're speculating like as this goes forward, if this has, you know, the turns into a series of events like on an annual basis, I wonder if there'll be a new generation of stars that will specialise in just this because they're great indoor triathletes but maybe not outdoors i mean it's an in- intriguing proposition absolutely really. i think that's a big possibility and you know this idea of training and racing on robots right and so there's there's a lot of conversation and uh 
you know, debate about whether or not what you do on Zwift in a virtual cycling is, is consistent with your ability out, outdoors. And there's the erg effect uh, when you don't have the ability to really coast. So there's so many things uh, to talk about there and, and running on, on treadmills, especially curved treadmills where you actually have to generate the momentum to get it started. There's, there's so much there that you could do an entire podcast on just those conversations and bring in, you know, exercise physiologists to, and, and other scientists uh, to, to talk about it. But I think you're right. There is, there is the potential that this could be um, blown up for the recreational athlete who maybe doesn't want to deal with open water and, uh, you know, doesn't want to deal with, uh, you know, the inclement weather and, and things like that. I think there's actually a, a very big potential, especially now that, you know, COVID has just sort of propelled the environment into, you know, building out home gyms and virtual cycling and getting wearable technology. Now everybody's got a Peloton or a, a Peloton treadmill or a Peloton bike. This is uh there's a some substantial potential here for for people to get involved in in triathlon. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, so certainly I think it's intriguing and and yeah, maybe it opens up a, a wider demographic as well of people who I mean, I don't know what you found, but when I first got into triathlon, I found it, to to make the, the leap was quite intimidating to start mm -hmm. with it's, it's kind of you feel like you see a triathlon club of people I, I think back to like the local triathlon club that I'm still a member of and I'd see them out swimming in the sea or something or doing a little run on this on the Saturday and I, I would feel intimidated in a way to to get involved because you'd feel like oh, I don't really know enough about this or I'm just going to be just going to yes. be totally out of my depth in some way or another um but it, it, in actual fact when you get in and you get involved you realize actually you're not you're you're capable of competing with people but um to to kind of break down some of those barriers to entry that actually if you have got your bike at home you can get involved if you're used to running or, or on your treadmill or cycling in your garage that's something you can still do it's yeah. uh, and and that just that removing that barrier to entry is um is potentially significant as well in getting more people into the sport. And I think that's one thing at Super League that I, I know that we're a very, very small group of people. There's not many of us. Um, but one thing I do know is that we are all very passionate about not just growing Super League, but we want to grow triathlon. We Most of us there are triathletes. We love the sport. We're really into it. Um, and and we, we believe that we genuinely believe our athletes – uh, and triathletes in general are the best athletes in the world. Mm -hmm. What other Absolutely. athletes are mastering so many sports? And and when you look at our athletes, um, who are the you know the Olympians, effectively, they're they're able to swim, run, and bike their their legs almost at the the speed that those people who are just specialising in those sports can do. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, we've also seen um, we've we've also seen uh, from the first event of this one in, in Rotterdam, the Arena Games uh like a, a huge surge of interest as well which, which has obviously been very nice and very rewarding from our point of view but also underlines possibly the potential there is here uh i mean there's been a big media interest around it partly because it's so different i think uh and so unique um but also then once we've done the first one and you're able to then show people actually this isn't a gimmick it's not a computer game or, or, or a gimmick. Actually, this is, these are top level athletes competing at the top of their game. It's just the format, the way they're doing it. Yeah. It's a little bit different. It's definitely a bit quirky. And I, I also accept that it's not for everybody. You do traditionalists, traditionalists who just love a swim bike run outdoor format. The arena games maybe is not for them. Hopefully they'll enjoy our championship series. Um, which is like, our, as I said, our outdoor events. Um, 
and maybe it's not for them but maybe it is for a lot of other people and it's for a lot of other people perhaps who are not as traditionally involved in triathlon and as well as the big media interest ahead of uh the arena games in london that, that we've just had we also had a significant interest from broadcasters as well mm-hmm. which was very rewarding so i think we broadcast live in 179 territories around the world from london at the weekend so yeah i mean we 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 don't have all the figures but certainly i think we'd be predicting to break into hopefully millions of viewers and and that's huge for triathlon as well it's a good platform for triathlon you know outside of the olympics triathlon needs these these big events doesn't it to to raise its profile and to to bring right. in people that aren't like in the UK, for example, we were on the BBC on the on the red button and on the iPlayer, and the BBC is the biggest broadcaster in the UK by by a considerable distance. In in Germany, we were on Sport One, which is again free to air and the biggest broadcaster there, and and it just exposes more people to it. And if more more people we can get to see uh, triathlon and to see our athletes in action, I think the better it is for our sport in general, not just for super league, but actually for, for elevating our sport. And, and yeah, I think that's a really important part yeah. of what we're doing. Yeah. Especially in the, in the United States in the, you know, so I mentioned it earlier that, you know, short course is, is, is big overseas in the United States. Ironman is really what people are focused on. So I, I see this potentially in the States to, increase the interest in in short course racing uh do you think that you you guys would eventually try to make this a recreational athlete or an age group athlete type of uh event that you could launch in you know different regions yeah so so that's like a honestly the truth is on that it's a very difficult question because um uh, you know as super league our primary focus is on the professional athletes right that is really where we are focused we're like that that mantra of trying to turn a participation sport into a spectator sport is something that we really are working on mm-hmm. and and the professional series is really uh, of our championship series and our arena games is really the heart of what we're doing rather than necessarily be in a mass participation brand and looking Mm -hmm. to to build it out we want to find a way really to um to elevate the professional level of the sport uh to elevate our uh professional athletes and to find a way to commercialize that to make that a viable commercial proposition going forward and make our sport a viable commercial proposition going forward i mean like when when I look at it from and and, and I have no uh, inside knowledge of Iron Man or no, so I just look at it from the outside as a fan of the sport. Obviously, the I know the the PTO criticism of Iron Man is is kind of around the the not using the professionals to to the full extent. But I guess that maybe Iron Man look at that commercially from a business point of view and say, well, obviously we make we make our money as a business from um from from the age groupers who who pay to participate so yeah. from our point of view we're trying to make a business um out of the professional racing so uh the age group racing is an interesting question and it kind of is something that's raised and it's not totally out of the question that we would ever do it or that we would do elements of it but it's not our primary focus our primary focus is around um, is certainly around the professional aspect. We have done other things, um, for example, uh, as a uh, as kind of a bit of a test and a bit of a promotional tool for the event, uh, yeah. and to also uh, really try and get try and do something positive for the sport and get people back competing again. Before the event in uh, London, we did um, a series of uh, races on Zwift um, uh, as uh, super league events effectively for for triathlon clubs so for, yeah. for your ordinary uh you know age groupers out there that could take part um there's there were six races in total three bikes and three runs over a three-week period and then we sort of had leaderboards for the triathlon clubs um we had more than a thousand people take part in that 
we're doing something similar that's just started running in mainland Europe around the uh, build up to the Rotterdam event. But like I say, at the moment, the, the idea of that, that's we're not trying to monetize that in any way. In fact, we're spending money uh, to make it happen. Um, but the idea is is partly to try and give back a bit and to, and to give, give people some something to do. But also it's an engagement tool as well because it gets people thinking about the racing thinking about our events as well. These are people obviously who probably would already be interested in fairness, but it's still, it makes them feel closer to it. It's, it gives us a good chance to talk to them more about our professionals and our racing as well. So whilst the, the age group thing is, is great and something that, you know, we're keen to develop our sport and promote our sport. We think a great way of doing that is by elevating our professionals and getting people to enjoy the professional racing and being inspired by our professionals to want to go out and try triathlon themselves as opposed to us becoming a mass participation yeah. company. Or just inspire people to, you know, mix up their training a little bit. Right. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, swimming after running is one of the hardest things that you can, you could do. So maybe super league after watching it, people start to mix up their training and get very, very innovative training ideas. So you mentioned the, the pro athletes. Now, uh, how do the pro athletes get involved with Super League? Do they have to qualify? Do you have to sign a contract? Uh, how, how does that work? So it's a it's an interesting again an interesting way, and it, it has it has fluctuated during the short history of Super League as we've tried to find the best way to get a mixture of the best athletes in the best mm-hmm. young talent and give them a chance. And that's something that Super League has been very keen to promote down its, its short span. People like um, Hayden Wild, people like uh, Vasco Velaka, um, Jonas Schomburg. These, mm-hmm. these are people who really have, have um, gained notoriety because they were given a chance in Super League and uh, to develop their careers. And so that's important as well. So going into 2021, um, we will be uh, slightly changing things up from the previous formats, partly because of the way the world is now and, and re- the realities of what yeah. you could do. We did have qualification events. We're not having qualification events this year. I mean, it's pretty obvious why you can't stage qualification events at the moment. So, right. um yeah, so it will be this year, you know, a, a kind of a discussion with athletes, athletes who come to us who want to take part, athletes we go to who we want to take part, uh, and agreeing kind of if if what and if we can do together to work with them, basically, to get yeah. them on our start lines um, uh, and to try and produce fields that produce the best racing. And I think one thing that's been interesting with the Arena Games uh, that's a little bit different to the Championship Series is we've got space for 10 men, we've got space for 10 women. And what we've tried to do is mix it up a little bit. So we haven't just had the same people doing the same things all the time. We have had, we've tried to throw in long course athletes and and middle distance 70.3 specialists as well. For example, the we, uh, London, we had, um, you know, in the men's field, we had, uh, Tim Don, obviously triathlon legend, uh, taking part, and uh, Ironman, well, former Ironman world record holder. And we had George Goodwin, who um, had a breakout event uh, in Daytona in the massive PTO race last year, um, finishing in the on the podium in that race. Yeah. Uh, so they were both taking so nice. part in the women's field. We had Ruth Astle, who was the who's now a pro British pro, but was um, has been uh, 2019 uh, Kona age group world champion. Uh, and we also had Lucy Charles Barkley, yep. of course, three times runner up at uh, Kona and multiple Ironman winner around the world. One of the best long course athletes of the last five years, uh, most consistent athletes of the last five years. So we had people taking part against the ITU stars against the real short, short stars who some of them are great at Olympic distance. Some of them are great at sprint. Some of them are great at the mixed team relay. And then we've got long course. We've got middle distance athletes right. all competing against each other in this, in this, in this format. So you can kind of see where are the cracks, you know, in people, what, what works best. Last year we had Annie Haug, the Ironman world Annie champion, Haug, yeah. <laughs> uh, taking part as well. And she was fascinating because 
she was came from ITU and went into Ironman like many people do. Uh, obviously, won the world title and um, came back down to short course to have a go at at the Arena Games. And she was fascinating in the sense that um, she said she thought before the event her top end speed wouldn't be enough to compete with the the top ITU girls. But unlike almost all of them, she got faster. So every stage of the three stages of the event, she got quicker and quicker and quicker, as whereas obviously most of the sprint athletes got slower and slower and slower. But it, that was that an interesting aside from a long distance athlete coming into it as opposed to a you know a short course athlete and, and how they, they sort of manage their energy systems, as it were. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. mean, there's plenty in there. So it's good for, from our point of view to get athletes on the start line that produce a mix. And from our point of view, it's also a... It's also a storytelling. We want it to be engaging. We want people to engage with the athletes. We want people to follow the racing and follow the storylines, the rivalries between the athletes as well. The the kind of veteran warriors giving it giving it a good go to hold off the the real young pups that are just trying to find their breakthrough and and have that moment where the the up and coming twenty year old beats the the 38 year old legend that they grew up watching on TV, those kind of storylines it's, it's creating fields that will create really competitive, exciting racing yeah. a, and drive storylines and interest for, in our, from our audience as well. Okay. So let's see for, for the listeners who, who have been hearing this, how can they watch some of your upcoming events? And uh, you can, you know, talk about some of the, social media that you have out there and how, how can they get more access to uh, some of the super league events? So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a, it's an interesting question, I think, because actually one of the things that we're trying to do this year is, is also produce a lot more content this year, a, a yeah. lot more content, particularly around our, our pro athletes. As I said before, the, the heroing them, they're trying to make them stars is, um, and trying to make people more invested in who they are, uh, I think is important for our sport. When you look at other sports, and I mentioned I came from a, come from a, a largely a, a football soccer mm-hmm. background, um, in working with the Premier League, which is obviously one of the biggest global sports leagues. Um, the people know the stories of the players; they know their backgrounds, they know who they are. They're they're very invested in them as individuals as well as their own teams and their own clubs, and that's something that doesn't really exist very much in triathlon with the professionals. They're, they're kind of almost seen as a sort of robots in a way. They just turn yeah. up every so often. You see them put in these amazing performances, and then you don't hear of them until they pop up again at some point in, right. in the future. And they've got great backstories. You speak to these people, they are fascinating. You know, they're not, um, they're not rich pampered prima donna sports people they've come from a lot of them from hard backgrounds and and they've worked tirelessly to get to where they are and they've gone through all kinds of struggles because triathlon isn't a sport that has loads of money in it there's not loads of riches on offer for them so they've had to go and find different ways and means to get to the top and you hear all kinds of great stories as to how they've done it and we want those stories to be told so Mm -hmm. our social media channels and particularly our super league triathlon youtube channel we're starting to roll out a lot of content and there'll be a lot more throughout the year um focusing on our athletes we're spending a lot of time abroad uh with them with crews out with them to to find ways to showcase their training which is interesting for a triathlon audience but also showcase their stories as well um, the ones that have got such interesting stories and backgrounds so people can get to know them a bit better so the super league youtube channel is the place to go for that we also host our races on there you can go on our youtube channel and you can see um uh, any of our past races they're all on there uh they're they're a great watch and i know a lot of people uh, in triathlon love to go through the archive of the races if they've got a turbo session or something like that and they really want some fun action to to sort of uh, watch while they're they're doing that they they are really entertaining and very different uh, i think and i think they're well worth a watch when it comes to actually viewing the live events uh we we always have a how to head to the super league website we have a, a how to watch section that we produce a story on for every event you'll be able to see the broadcaster in your region uh, and also 
um, anywhere that's not got an exclusive deal, uh, you'll be able to also go to our YouTube channel mm-hmm. and you'll see the stream of it live. You can watch it. It's the same broadcast quality, same commentators, Will and Chris McCormack. Um, and we're really keen to, to obviously get people to watch. We spend a, we've spend we got a great social media and digital team um, now as well. So our Instagram channel in particular is is really really good there's loads of great content in there we get a lot of interaction with our athletes who love being part of it as well and it's sort of a, a community feel there even though it's got 170,000 followers or, or whatever it is so yeah. I, th- I think there's lots of different touch points uh, that are good for Super League but if somebody came to me and said I, I want to kind of get the essence of it what are you who are your athletes what are they about where can I see some action head to Super League Travel on YouTube channel because you'll find absolutely bags of content there what's the uh, youtube handle it's just super league uh super league try is super our, try. our handle handle okay. across our social channels Excellent. so yeah head, head on over and it, uh, definitely an exciting uh innovation of triathlon for sure so before we uh conclude is there anything else uh that you want our listeners to know about super league well, I guess, uh, I suppose, uh, the, probably the, the things to note are what we've got coming up. Um, mm-hmm. So we've got another Arena Games, the the indoor format we've spoken about, uh, that will be in Rotterdam on April the 18th. Uh, so that's that's the next date in the diary. Right. And then at the end of April, we, we'll have a fairly significant day for us, um, which will be we'll be announcing mm-hmm. our, uh, our, our championship series events as well. Yeah, uh, we'll be in a position to do that and confirm where we'll be. Um, we're still working. <laughs> There's still a lot of work going on in the background. There's a lot of people putting in a lot of hours diligently to get everything sorted uh, and firmed up and finalized. But it's looking like we'll have a good calendar this year. Um, it will be post Olympics. It will be all contained in a year. We'll have back to back racing weekends as well. So hopefully that will help people buy into it and understand the storylines as we we go through and we've got some really exciting locations across the world that we'll be heading to some great places as well um i guess for for you know in america people will be hopefully interested uh, we, we we announced um a few months ago that we'd acquired the malibu triathlon obviously one of the most historic oh, really? triathlons in the world um so that is that will be um that will be interesting we haven't announced exactly what we're doing in terms of uh in terms of the super league element of that yet we're still finalizing how that will be but we should be in a position to confirm that at the same time um so yeah we're, we're gonna we're trying to go all over the world basically and, and kind of spread the message of, of short course racing and, and of our professionals we believe they're we genuinely believe they're the best best athletes in the world we believe we've got formats that are exciting and entertaining and that people will enjoy watching um and, and our our aim is just to spread that message as wide and far and to get people to give it a go yes. uh, because we feel like the more people will will watch the more people will enjoy it um we, we're pretty confident that people will like it it's just getting it in front of them and then if we can get it in front of them and they enjoy it then hopefully we can inspire even more people to take part in in triathlon because and endurance sports because uh, we truly believe that they're they're life changing, transformational, and they're uh, and they're they're a great lifestyle and a, and and our pros are great role models for it. Yep. All right. Well, if you want to go, you you got the website for all your listeners that are interested. Superleaguetriathlon dot com. And I'm definitely looking forward to uh, watching some of the uh, the events unfold in, in April and beyond. All right. Adam Leach, thanks for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thanks again, Adam Leach, Director of Communications for Super League Triathlon. Could this be the next big thing in triathlon for all you diehard triathletes out there go out and check out super league triathlon on their youtube channel and their social media platforms you'll see some very robust and dynamic content out there right now 
Looks like they have some amazing events coming up over the next couple of months, and I'll be watching Super League Triathlon very closely and very interested in this. And so for some of the listeners that are still haven't yet jumped into the triathlon waters, give it a shot. And the time now, more than any, is ripe where you can you know, do a lot of running and biking at home if you've built out your home gyms. And even if you, uh, when we start getting back into your local facilities, you can try it out and create your own little super league. Swim in the pool, hop on the bike, hop on your treadmill, mix up the events. You will be absolutely blown away with the physical benefits when you can train every aspect of your endurance and strength, swimming, cycling, and running. That's it for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. This is the Endurance Experience. Follow Event Horizon Endurance Sport on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For training and nutrition programs and on-demand learning, to become a member of our Endurance Institute, or for complete archive of podcasts, log on to our website, eventhorizon.tv.